it feels like we're entering an era when the fragility or robustness of blockchain ecosystems will finally shine through. Does your chain have a broken security model? Is it based on the popularity of a centralized exchange that's under regulatory fire? Did you rely too much on DeFi, not knowing that KYC and accreditation could cripple it? Cardano might be resting easy right now, while some other blockchain ecosystems might turn out to be glass houses. Ready? Let's go. Today, we're going to discuss a pretty big unexpected exploit in Ethereum validation where slashing does not appear to have been a good deterrent, a big rumor that doesn't sound too good for Binance, and some ominous news about DeFi front ends out of Europe. If this image reminds you of something that happened to you in college one night after a house party, or if you're finding value in these videos each weekday, please consider delegating to the Army of Spies stake pool, ticker AOS. For a long time now, we in the Cardano ecosystem have been saying that the slow, methodical, scientific approach of the architects of Cardano to build out a robust blockchain that doesn't have gaping holes would eventually pay dividends. And it looks like we've finally reached that era, or maybe we have, because things are popping up in other blockchain ecosystems that don't seem to be popping up in Cardano that probably tend to put into question some of the fundamental assumptions in some of these other blockchains. We're going to talk about a few of them, but one of the most interesting is, is something that happened just today, I guess maybe yesterday and today in Ethereum. We've talked many times on this channel about minor extractable value, now called maximal extractable value, and the sandwiching of transactions, something that I've always thought really had no place in, in crypto, something that really has no place in blockchains. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's an exploit of the users. I'm not really down with minor extractable, extractable value. It looks like there was someone else who may or may not have been down with the whole concept of minor extractable value, but he was more than happy to extract a lot of value from, according to this post, five different MEV bots. So if you want to know exactly how this happened, this thread right here is a great one explaining exactly what went down. But the actual mechanisms by which this exploit operated are not as interesting to me as the sort of context that this happened in, in relation to slashing. One thing to point out is that people weren't exactly really upset about this. I think on some level, people have always felt a little bit victimized by the existence of minor extractable value and this whole sort of a network that kind of industrializes minor extractable value in Ethereum. So of course, people were posting images like this, calling it a W for the, uh, for the party that had exploited all of the MEV bots. I've always thought that MEV was a big weakness for the, for the Ethereum ecosystem, but an even bigger problem in this case is illustrated in this thread. So this thread points out the malicious validator who drained the MEV bots this morning has been slashed by the protocol in this block, which sounds okay, right? Maybe if you're, if you're, if you're not super anti MEV, this is probably okay with you until you see this part. How much was he slashed? He was slashed one ether, which is about 1800 bucks. While he made, and I've seen differing reports right now, it's still kind of early, but I've seen reports that he either made 20 or 25 million. So the slashing disincentive here, the slashing penalty is completely not a deterrent. If you're going to make 20 or 25 million by doing something like this, and you're only going to get slashed one ETH, you're probably happy to get slashed one ether all day long. You'll do this as many times as you possibly can to trade one ether for 20 or 25 million. And everybody's kind of okay with it this time, like I said, because nobody nobody's really loves minor extractable value or minor extractable value bots. But 
this goes to show that the slashing deterrent in Ethereum doesn't always operate the way people think it's going to be. It's not necessarily a good deterrent in a lot of these cases if the amount that you're going to be slashed is so much less than the amount of the exploit you might be executing. This poster put the point very concisely. 25 million profit for 1800 slash the vulnerability is in the design. Also, you probably noticed that today was the day that Elon Musk finally substituted the Dogecoin logo for the Twitter logo over here, which of course led to Dogecoin proceeding to ram its way up the top 10 on the crypto charts. Can you even imagine what Cardano would do if we were ever given this kind of exposure? The other big drama in crypto today was this. So this is a SHA-256 hash. So we've talked about this before on the channel, but the way this works is if you throw something into the SHA-256 hashing algorithm, it spits out a hash that looks like this. And you can always go forward. You can always go from the input to the output, but until we have quantum computing, basically you can't go backwards from the output to the input. So what people will do sometimes is if they have a prediction to make that they don't want to reveal, they'll post the SHA-256 hash of that prediction. And then if it comes true, they can reveal the input and then people can verify that it was that input, that prediction in plain, you know, plain human language that produced this output from SHA-256. So it's a great way to make predictions and then only reveal them if they come true. And Kobe, who is a big crypto personality with over three quarters of a million followers on Twitter, he makes a lot of these kinds of predictions. He posts these kinds of SHA-256 hashes pretty often, often enough over the last year or so. He claims like 20 times. We'll see in just a second. And it's never been a problem because it's SHA-256. Until we have quantum computing, nobody can break it. Until today. So not too long after Kobe posted his SHA-256 hash, someone posted this that shows that Interpol red notice for CZ were the words that was the uh, that was the string of words that produces this hash down here. You can see that that hash right there is the same as the one that Kobe posted, which confused everybody because we all know no one can hack SHA-256 right now. Currently, that's not a thing. This was kind of a problem for Kobe because that rumor started spreading like wildfire and people were basically accusing him of market manipulation. In fact, right up here, somebody said, I highly doubt Kobe would willingly manipulate the markets with a joke, question mark. People saying Kobe said it's not true. And he responded, nobody is supposed to be able to read it, have posted greater than 20 of these in the past with zero being broken, which means someone I was speaking to about the rumor has leaked it to cause a stir at my expense or someone brute force shot to 56, which we know is not the case. But yeah, it wasn't supposed to be readable. I think the interesting thing here is not the identity of the party who leaked in, in probably a party in Kobe's inner circle who leaked this information. The interesting thing is the giant impact this rumor had. Here's a thread where someone is attempting to explain how did a single tweet cause 50 million in liquidations, 50 million USD in liquidations is a big impact indeed. And I think the problem here is not so much that a prediction like this was leaked. It's that just the possibility of CZ being arrested by Interpol could cause such a gigantic economic move in these markets. And I don't think that has, I don't think that's really the fault of the market. It's that in crypto, we were never supposed to have a gigantic top 10 ecosystem that revolves so directly around one centralized exchange and one person running that exchange. That's sort of contrary to the idea of crypto that we've had, you know, all along, at least up until the last few years. We were always trying to avoid those kinds of central points of failure. And in Binance, you've got almost nothing but a gigantic centralized point of failure. So much so that uh, we, we won't 
go into all of the sort of, I'll call them regulatory avoidance strategies that Binance has had to engage in, you know, not having physical offices or at least not acknowledged physical offices, not domiciling the entity anywhere, uh, you know, never sort of leaving a record of who actually owns the entity or even, you know, if there is an entity, all of these things are obviously you know, strategies to deal with the, uh, the regulators and the regulatory, uh, the regulatory pressure that they knew would eventually come and that has arrived right now. But this is exactly what crypto was always trying to avoid. I mean, why was Satoshi anonymous? Because I think Satoshi realized that the fate of Bitcoin would be very different if there was a Satoshi to arrest. We never had to worry about Interpol red alert for Satoshi. That's why Satoshi was anonymous. Uh, we never had to worry about some giant centralized exchange being shut down and it killing Bitcoin. Okay, you know, you could argue to some extent that kind of did happen with Mt. Gox. We did have one giant uh, centralized exchange, but Bitcoin, the identity of Bitcoin was never tied up in that exchange. All the trading was happening on Mt. Gox. And when Mt. Gox fell, it certainly had an impact on price, but it wasn't existential. The, the original idea of Bitcoin didn't change because Mt. Gox rose and then fell. I'm not so sure that that's the case with Binance and the BNB um, ecosystem. It seems like they're so strongly tied to this one exchange that is so strongly tied to this one personality, it's no surprise that a rumor of an Interpol red alert for the arrest of that person would result in 50 million plus in liquidations. This is the kind of regulatory central point of failure that you don't want in crypto ecosystems. Finally, I obviously also think some ecosystems have leaned way too far into DeFi, and this has been something I've been talking about for a long time. But now we're starting to see the whole regulatory scene, not just in the US, it turns out, sort of shifting in that direction. Here's a post that says, the finance regulator of France is calling for treating DeFi web interfaces, those are front ends, as intermediaries imposing KYC and potentially accredited investor standards, leverage caps, and et cetera on those DeFi front ends. So think about that for a second. We're talking about KYC, accredited investor standards, and leverage caps. KYC is going to be a problem for some people, but accredited investor standards are a huge problem for a huge number of people who are probably currently using these DeFi front ends. So if we look into, if we look into the actual tech, text that's being referenced here, we see things like, this would mean in particular that web interfaces would also be subject to the obligation to carry out standard customer enrollment procedures. Um, it seems indispensable that access to financial products depends on the financial competence of the client and their risk appetite. That is some coded language that they're going to uh, impose accredited investor standards on the users of DeFi front ends. That's a bad thing because I know a whole bunch of people using DeFi currently who are not accredited investors. They do not have either the income or the assets to prove they're accredited investors. So under these kinds of standards, depending on what the threshold is, in the, U in the US, it's going to be way too high for a lot of DeFi users. So if the same thing were to happen in the US, I don't know what the French threshold is, but in the US, the threshold would mean, I don't know, maybe the majority, the vast majority of people using DeFi would no longer be able to use DeFi. Only people with very high incomes or a lot of assets would be able to use DeFi. Again, I don't know what the threshold is in France, but I imagine it's probably also pretty high. These intermediaries are currently of two main types, centralized providers of services on crypto assets and web interfaces, front ends of decentralized protocols. So there you go. It's not a stretch. Nobody's stretching here to make it sound like this is going to apply to D5 front ends. They're telling you right there, web interfaces, front ends of decentralized protocols.
So you might argue, hey, this is just one country in Europe. This is no big deal. It's not like it's going to apply to all of Europe. But then there's this follow-up post from a French lawyer. Knowing that MICA was inspired by the French regulations, it could be worth reading it because it could be a glimpse into what will happen for MICA too. And the poster says, it's rapidly looking like real DeFi slash crypto will be illegal throughout the world. So this is this kind of thing. I think um, people who are paying attention probably could have guessed that we might be going in this direction sometime in 2023, 2024. And who knows how long this will take to develop. And again, these are just calls for this to happen in France. This isn't something that's like, you know, currently on the books or anything like that. But this is exactly the reason why I was kind of happy that Cardano never experienced the kind of, or at least so far, hasn't experienced the kind of DeFi boom that we saw in Ethereum. I mean, ask yourself, what happens in the Ethereum ecosystem if all of a sudden we had KYC and accredited investor standards? The vast majority of the use of DeFi in Ethereum probably goes away. I mean, you could argue maybe the maybe the accredited investors doing DeFi stuff in Ethereum, you know, maybe by dollar volume, they make up um, a, a large amount of the volume. But by users, I think it's safe to assume that the vast majority of users using DeFi in crypto probably aren't accredited investors. By user volume, we're probably going to lose a gigantic amount of the DeFi volume. What is what does the Ethereum ecosystem look like? I mean, if all if all of DeFi or some gigantic chunk of DeFi and it's just accredited investors using DeFi, what does Ethereum look like? I mean, what have we got left? We've got NFTs. I mean, there's games, there's metaverses, there's, you know, other really utility driven things outside of DeFi, but that's a different ecosystem if DeFi is gone. And in Cardano, I think if the same thing happened in Cardano, a much larger percentage of our whole ecosystem is still left over because we didn't get overwhelmed by DeFi. There wasn't a giant wave of DeFi that washed over Cardano. A much smaller percentage of our ecosystem is DeFi than in a blockchain ecosystem like Ethereum. Finally, in case you missed it, there is another Chaz and Ginger Snaps AMA waiting for you on YouTube. I didn't name it. That's what they named the first one. I don't think they I don't think they use that name uh, for this second AMA featuring the two of them, but I think in my mind that's forever how I'll how I'll know these AMAs, Chaz and Ginger Snaps. I think they're pretty good though. It's really good to uh, to hear from a second perspective about the way things work inside IOG because Charles tends to comment sort of on the world in general and you know what's going on in Cardano generally, and it seems like they get into uh, a lot more specific conversation in these AMAs about how things actually work inside IOG, which is always really interesting to me. The March Cardano 360 is also now available, and apparently now it's called the Essential Cardano 360, but it's great content about what's actually going on in Cardano, as always. I hope you're having a great week, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.